Today we will be covering chapter three. This chapter explores the structure and function of cells. Did you know that scientists estimate that the first cell originated on Earth about 3.8 billion years ago? However, it wasn't until the 1600s that Robert Hooke looked through his microscope and saw something that reminded him of monastery cells, and that is what he called them, cells. We've been studying them ever since. Experts say that there's more than 37 trillion cells in the human body. Interestingly, 50 to 70 billion of those cells die every day. It's important to note that while there are 37 trillion cells in our body, there are different sizes and different shapes. Do you know what the largest cell in the human body is? What about the smallest? If you guessed that the female egg is the largest cell, you would be correct. Conversely, the smallest cell in the human body is the male sperm. The female egg is approximately 150 micrometers when compared with the sperm that is 50 micrometers. So the cell is composed of three main parts, which are the plasma membrane, the cytoplasm, and the nucleus. The cytoplasm is kind of like the factory floor. A factory has all of its workers, equipment, machines, everything inside that it needs to do its job. Well, the cytoplasm has all of the specialized structure inside the cell that the cell needs to do its job, and these are called organelles. Despite the fact that the plasma membrane is three ten millionths of an inch thick, it's strong enough to keep the cell whole and intact, and it also forms other life-preserving functions of the cell. One of the things that the cell membrane does is it serves as a boundary or a gateway between the fluid inside the cell and the fluid around it. Now we talked uh, in chapter two, when we talked about chemistry, we discussed phospholipids. Here you can see in this image, the phospholipid bilayer that makes up the plasma membrane. And we also talked about how cholesterol inserts itself within the phospholipid bilayer uh, as a structural support mechanism. You can also see other structures within the phospholipid bilayer, and these structures um, help with a variety of functions such as transport, signaling, self-identification, anchoring of fibers, and chemical processing. When we talk about the cell membrane, we say that it's selectively permeable. And this goes back to that idea of it being like a well-guarded gateway. So the, the Cell membrane is responsible for regulating everything that goes in and out of the cell. However, there is one thing that can move in and out of the cell without any difficulty, and that is water. Ribosomes are organelles that look like tiny little dots. And you can see in this top image, these little black dots, these would be the ribosomes, and this membrane that it's attached to is called the endoplasmic reticulum, and we'll talk about that next. If there, uh, there are two areas of the endoplasmic reticulum, one is called smooth and one is called rough. Well, the area where the, these little ribosomes attach in the endoplasmic reticulum is called the rough ER. In the smooth ER, the ribosomes don't attach, and we'll talk about those reasons uh, coming up on the next slide. However, 
the job of the ribosome is to make enzymes and proteins. So a lot of the time we refer to these little guys as protein factories. They're made up of two tiny subunits um, and mostly they're composed of what's called ribosomal RNA and they are used to manufacture those proteins, those polypeptide chains that we talked about in our chemistry chapter. So here we see the endoplasmic reticulum. Now if you look at this image you can see that uh, that kind of purplish circle um, is the nucleus. So that is actually the center of the cell and then you can see the rough ER is the blue surrounding it. It has the little ribosomes attached. And then the smooth ER extends out from the rough ER. So this network of con connecting sacs and canals is where proteins are folded and transported outside of the cell. Now, um, if the proteins that are being manufactured are going to stay inside the cell, that's typically the job of the smooth ER. Uh, the smooth ER is responsible for synthesizing chemicals that help to maintain the cell membrane. Uh, this makes sense, this process um, of this endoplasmic reticulum being closely adjacent to the nucleus if we think about the process that cells go through to make new proteins. That process actually begins in the nucleus with the DNA. Like I spoke about in our previous lecture, DNA will unwind to allow RNA to come in and make a copy of that DNA. Now that copy is called a, uh, is copying is called transcribing. And transcribing is really like writing a code or making a photocopy, like I said before. That all happens in the nucleus. Once the um, code leaves the nucleus, that signals the two ribosomal units to attach to that code. This happens out in the cytoplasm, and this is called translation. Translation is basically deciphering of the code, and this deciphering of a code makes a protein. Now, some of the ribosomes attach themselves to the rough ER, and they insert the protein into the rough endoplasmic reticulum. This is just the first part of making a protein. Proteins still have to be um, synthesized and some chemical uh, shenanigans have to occur. It gets folded in a specific way. And as it travels through, it gets closer and closer and closer to the cell membrane where it can be packaged by the Golgi apparatus, which we're going to talk about next, and then transported out of the cell to do whatever job it was made to do. Now, the things that stay in-house are processed by the smooth endoplasmic reticulum and are typically sent to the cell membrane to um, fix the cell membrane to replace broken parts to maintain the integrity of the cell membrane. Okay, so here in this image up in the top left corner, I want you to look and see this greenish purple circle. Again, this is the nucleus, the center of the cell. Now, we just talked about the rough ER and the smooth ER, and you can see it there very close hugging the nucleus. And then we talked about how this is kind of a chemical uh, synthesizing plant as it's like helping to process these proteins that are either going to be used inside the cell or at the plasma membrane or sent outside the cell to do some other kind of job for the body. Okay, so check this out. You see this little 
sky coming off from the rough endoplasmic reticulum and it has these little purple dots in there it is filled with pro proteins so a little part uh, a little wall of the endoplasmic reticulum a little sac pinches off from the endoplasmic reticulum and it creates this little package right and this little package is a transport vesicle that transports these newly made proteins to the Golgi apparatus. Now the Golgi apparatus is this pink structure that's kind of more lower right corner. Um, so in the Golgi apparatus, and we refer to this structure as the packaging and shipping department. All right, more processing is going to go on inside the Golgi apparatus. So this little transport vesicle, it gets to the Golgi apparatus, it attaches to it, and it allows the contents, those newly made proteins, to move into the Golgi apparatus so that they can be synthesized um, completely as they travel through those um, little canals of the Golgi apparatus. Now, look what happens when they get on the other side. This is so ingenious. The mechanism is a new little vesicle is made on the other side to transport that developed protein to the cell membrane. So another vesicle forms on what we call the trans face, the face that's closest to the plasma membrane, and the vesicle transport breaks away from the Golgi apparatus and transports those newly made proteins to the cell membrane. It attaches to the cell membrane, it opens to the outside, and those proteins are expelled outside of the plasma membrane. And then look what happens this little vesicle gets incorporated into the plasma membrane, which is a mechanism that the cell has for maintaining and adding new components to the cell membrane. Simply amazing. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the mito mitochondria. Now these guys are often referred to as the power plants or the powerhouse of the cell because their job is to break down glucose to release energy in the form of adenosine triphosphate or ATP. Now, the number of mitochondria per cell varies widely. For example, red blood cells don't have any mitochondria, where cells like liver and muscle could have hundreds or thousands of mitochondria per cell. Inside the mitochondria is where cellular respiration takes place, and we will be talking about cellular respiration more specifically in a later lecture. The lysosome is a membranous walled structure that resembles a little sac. And you can see a couple pictures here I have that identify the lysosomes. You can see they look like little circles or little walled off sacs. I like to think of lysosomes as trash cans. The lysosome's job is basically to break down or digest larger molecules. Remember, in our chemistry lecture, we talked about hydrolysis. Lysosomes use hydrolysis to digest larger nutrient molecules. So a lot of times they're referred to as digestive bags, or as I like to call them, trash cans. All right. So they might take in microbes that are nearby and destroy them and uh, process them and push them out of the cell. Um, they were initially, scientists initially thought that they were responsible for something called apoptosis. And apoptosis is basically cell suicide or programmed cell death. Each of our cells, if they're functioning properly, are equipped with a mechanism called apoptosis, which initiates a cell death. 
So this way, cells that are damaged or not um, functioning properly will not be replicated. However, sometimes this mechanism goes awry or there's uh, the protein that codes for the mechanism isn't there for some reason and these cells are left to multiply, these damaged cells are left to multiply. In that case, the individual could see something like a tumor or some sort of cancerous growth. The centrosome is a region of the cytoplasm that is located near the nucleus. When now within the centrosome, there are two organelles called centrioles. Now, this structure is responsible for organizing the construction and deconstruction of these little tubes called microtubules. Now, these tubes are constructed and deconstructed several hundreds of thousands of times, uh, depending on when and if the cell needs to transport specific things inside and outside of the cell. If you haven't watched the video that I posted in the resources area, uh, I would highly suggest watching that inner life of the cell video. It really demonstrates the building uh, and the uh, tearing down of these microtubules uh, it also shows how motor proteins will grab on to the vesicles and grab on to the microtubule and use that to transport those little vesicles to the plasma membrane. Um, in addition to that, the centrosome also plays a big role in the formation of the cytoskeleton during uh, cellular division. So it plays a big role in that. Um, and the centrioles also play a big role in the function uh, of uh, cell reproduction as well. You can see in this middle image how the microtubules attach to the, to the centromeres, the centers of the chromosomes, and as the cell divides, exact uh, copies of the chromosomes are pulled uh, into each cell. There are three different types of cell extensions that we're going to talk about, microvilli, cilia, and flagella. So we're going to talk about the first two on this slide, the first one being microvilli. Now microvilli are small finger-like extensions that come off from the plasma membrane, and their job is to increase the absorptive surface area of the cell. A good example of this is in the small intestine. When we think about the job of the small intestine is to absorb all the nutrients that it can from the food that we eat. Cilia are fine hair-like extensions found on uh, the free or exposed surfaces of some cells. They are capable of moving in unison in a wave-like fashion. Um, a couple examples of these cilia uh, that are found on the taste buds are kind of like little antennae that allow them to sense different chemicals that are dissolved in the saliva. An example of cells that would have several hundred cilia capable of moving together would be uh, the, uh, the cells that line the respiratory system, and these cells help to propel mucus over the cells that line the respiratory tract and the reproductive um, tract as well of the fallopian tubes. Flagella are single projections extending from the cell surface, kind of like a tail. Example of this in the human body is the tail of the sperm cell that helps to propel it forward as it searches for the egg. The nucleus lies at the center of the cell and is surrounded by something called the nuclear envelope, which is a membrane that surrounds the nucleus. It's made up of two separate membranes and it contains these little holes called nuclear pores where ribosomes and transcribed RNA can move 
out of or into the nucleus. The nucleolus, as you can see in this picture here, is at the center of the nucleus, and that's where all of the genetic material is housed. Now there's fluid also inside the nucleus, and that is called nucleoplasm. So inside the nucleus, DNA is wound around proteins called chromatin. Now, when the cell is just operating and doing its thing and not thinking about replicating, the DNA is loosely coiled inside the nucleus. However, when the cell gets ready to replicate, the DNA becomes tightly packed and wound in anticipation of cellular division. Now we talked before that the DNA is really important because it contains all the recipes for the cell. And each cell contains 46 chromosomes inside the nucleus. The only cells that do not contain 46 chromosomes are the sex cells, which contain 23 chromosomes. So when it comes to the structure of a cell, form follows function. We only have to think about what is a cell's job to understand why it's structured in a specific way. Heart cells, for example, their job is to work together to beat uh, in unison to push blood throughout the body. So those cells are gonna have a lot more mitochondria because they need to do a lot more work. Another example would be the, the flagella of the sperm. So the job of the sperm is to fertilize the egg. And in order to do that, it has to move throughout the uterus and into the fallopian tube to find the egg. So it's form follows its function. There are two main transport mechanisms that the cell uses to move substances in and out of the cell. And those are passive transport and active transport. I like to think of passive transport as pushing a rock down a hill. So if you look at this image and you see the first image on the left, where the guy is standing at the top of the hill and pushes the rock, you don't have to do anything else after you push the rock. The rock goes down the hill all by itself. This is similar in cells where fluid or substances move across the membrane without the cell having to exert any type of energy. Now the other type is active transport. Active transport is kind of like pushing a rock up a hill. You have to exert a lot of energy in order to get that rock back up to the top of the mountain. So when we talk about passive transport, we say that substances move down a concentration gradient, or they move from a concentration, uh, a higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. So there's four types of passive transport processes that we're gonna talk about. Diffusion, osmosis, dialysis, and filtration. The first type of passive transport that we're gonna talk about is diffusion. The best way to think about diffusion is picture a cup of coffee. If you take a cup of coffee and you put a spoonful of sugar into the coffee and you let it sit for a couple of minutes and you take a drink, chances are it's gonna taste sweet. Why is that if the sugar started at the bottom? That's because the sugar diffused throughout the liquid. It will move from areas of higher concentration where you placed the lump of sugar or the spoonful of sugar and it will equally distribute itself throughout the fluid. This signifies moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration or down the concentration gradient. A good example of this is the movement of carbon dioxide out of the cells or the movement of sodium ions into nerve cells as the impulse moves along the cell. Osmosis and dialysis are two different types of specialized 
examples of diffusion. This type of diffusion is where water or some sort of substance is moving across a selectively permeable membrane. So first we're going to talk about osmosis. Osmosis is the diffusion of water. Some solutes can still pass, however, the majority of them cannot. So this leaves water as the substance that moves across the membrane. So we're going to use an example of salt concentration in the fluid outside the cell. So when we talk about concentrations of fluid outside the cell, there's three different ways we refer to them. Isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic. When we have an isotonic solution, that means that the salt concentration, we're using salt as an example here, it could be something else. So the salt concentration on the outside of the cell is exactly the same as the salt concentration on the inside of the cell. We say this is an isotonic solution and nothing happens to the cell. It's perfectly happy and perfectly normal. This is why we use 0.9% sodium chloride to irrigate wounds because this is the closest concentration to what is inside of our cells, so it doesn't cause them any harm. The next example would be a hypotonic solution. So in a hypotonic solution, the water surrounding the cell or outside of the cell has a lower concentration of salt. Conversely, this means that the concentration of salt inside the cell is going to be higher. Something that uh, helps me is to think of water follows salt. So when we're talking about osmosis, wherever there's the highest concentration of salt, water is going to go. So in this situation, the hypotonic solution has a low level of salt. Inside is a high level of salt. So water is going to move inside the cell to equalize the concentrations on both sides of the membrane. This could cause the cell to rupture or lyse. The third example is a hypertonic solution. A hypertonic solution is a solution where the concentration of salt in the water outside of the cell is much higher than the concentration inside of the cell. Remember, water follows salt. So water is going to move out of the cell and this is going to cause the cell to shrink or shrivel, and this is called crenation. Most, if not all of you, have probably heard of dialysis, and this is because dialysis is a process that is used to clean the blood of an individual whose kidneys are not functioning properly. So what happens with dialysis is there is some sort of membrane that is used that allows smaller particles or solutes to cross that membrane while others cannot. This results in an unequal distribution of some solutes on one side of the membrane as opposed to others, the other side of the membrane. Filtration is the movement of water and solutes across a membrane due to differences in hydrostatic pressure. So more water pressure on one side of the membrane is going to force solutes and water through the other side of the membrane. And a good example of this is how urine is formed. And you can see the picture here of Bowman's capsule and the, the hydrostatic pressure on the side where you see the vessels is higher than in the capsule. So fluid and solutes are going to get pushed across the membrane into the capsule to form urine. As I said before, active transport is a process that utilizes energy. So remember when we talked about the mitochondria is, is the powerhouse of the cell and it's responsible for generating ATP. Remember that active transport uses ATP 
to accomplish its goals. So we're going to talk about three different types, ion pumps, phagocytosis, and pinocytosis. Remember, this is characterized by an uphill movement of substances. So remember how we said passive transport substances move from higher concentration to lower concentration. That doesn't take any energy. It's passive. Sitting on the couch watching TV is passive. I'm not doing anything. But if I'm going to get up and do a workout, that takes energy. And that's an example of an active process. So this requires energy to move substances from a lower concentration to a higher concentration. A good example of this is how the thyroid works. The thyroid takes in iodine from all over the body. So certain little devices called pumps are needed to pump iodine into the thyroid where a higher concentration of iodine is already residing. Ion pumps are our first example of active transport that we're going to talk about. These ion pumps insert themselves into the phospholipid bilayer. So you can see that in the picture here that's representing different types of pumps. We have a sodium potassium pump, a sodium pump, a potassium pump, there's also calcium ion pumps as well. Each pump is specific to a certain ion. Now remember, this process takes energy and it's moving substances from a lower concentration to a higher concentration. This is really important when we think about how a nerve impulse moves across the neurons or nerve cells. When the cell is getting ready to receive an impulse, these ion pumps pump sodium out of the cell and it's kind of hanging out there on the other side, on the outside of the cell membrane and potassium is on the inside. Now, this is called polarization. When the impulse moves across the surface of the cell membrane, these channels reverse themselves and sodium comes flooding into the cell and potassium goes rushing out of the cell. This is called depolarization. So you can see how these pumps move substances from areas of lower concentration to higher concentration using energy to do the work that the cell needs. We're gonna finish up talking about active transport with phagocytosis and pinocytosis. Now phagocytosis, its literal translation means cell eating and pinocytosis means cell drinking. Phagocytosis enables cells to engulf large particles like bacteria. This is what white blood cells do, which are a part of our immune system. Once the particle is taken into the cell, then it can fuse with a lysosome where it can be ingested and broken down by those enzymes. Remember we said lysosomes are like the garbage cans or the digestive bags of the cell. Now, pinocytosis allows the cell to incorporate fluids or dissolved substances into the cell. Remember, this is referred to as cell drinking. Both of these processes, phagocytosis and pinocytosis, require ATP, so they are active transport mechanisms. So now that you have an understanding of active and passive transport, let's talk about what happens when these ion pumps or these processes don't function like they're supposed to. An example can be the protein pumps that pump chlor chloride in and out of the cell. When we have a situation where these pumps are not functioning properly, too much chloride can be pumped out of the cell. Now, remember we talked about sodium being a positive ion and it's attracted to chloride. So it's gonna follow chloride out. Now we also talked about how water follows salt. So this is going to cause 
water to leave the cell. What happens in situations like this? There's two examples here. One is cystic fibrosis, which affects the lungs. When chloride pumps are pumping out too much chloride, sodium follows the chloride out and water follows the sodium out and we end up with these really thick mucus secretions in the airway that result in difficulty breathing. A second example is with cholera. Cholera is a bacterial infection that causes cell linings in the intestines to leak chloride. Again, sodium is gonna follow chloride out, water is gonna follow sodium out, and now we're left with crenated cells and increased water, which is gonna result in significant uh, diarrhea and water loss. Now we're gonna switch gears and talk about cellular growth and reproduction. In chapter two, the chemistry chapter, we got just a little preview of DNA and RNA, and so now we're gonna go ahead and fill in some of those details. Remember that we said DNA is in the shape of a double helix, and it has these molecules called nucleotides. And nucleotides are made up of three substances, a base, a sugar, and a phosphate. Now the bases for DNA are adenine, thiamine, guanine, and cytosine. Remember, adenine binds to thiamine and guanine binds to cytosine. So we have A's attached to T's and G's attached to C's in DNA. So take a second and think about the next question on the slide. What does adenine bind to? If you said thiamine, you would be correct. What did I say cytosine binds to? That's right, guanine. So what is a gene anyway, and what are the functions of genes? A gene is a specific segment of base pairs in a chromosome. Each gene has a different sequence of base pairs. This is extremely important because this sequence of base pairs is what determines what the gene will produce. It might produce a protein, an enzyme, a hormone, or it might combine with other proteins to do a different job. Isn't it amazing that we inherit more than a million bits of information from each of our two biological parents? This is what makes the human body so complex. In humans, having 46 nuclear chromosomes and one kind of mitochondrial chromosome in each body cell, DNA has a content of genetic information totaling about 3 billion base pairs and perhaps 25,000 protein coding genes. Remember that we said that DNA has complementary base pairing and each step in the ladder of the DNA contains a base pair. Remember adenine? pairs with thiamine, and cytosine pairs with guanine in DNA. Genetic code performs a variety of functions. Genetic code can code information in genes to control proteins, enzyme production, and cellular chemical reactions that determine the cell structure and function. So where exactly does protein synthesis occur? Well, protein synthesis actually occurs in the cytoplasm. Remember when we talked about ribosomes and the endoplasmic reticulum, that these structures live in the cytoplasm, which means it occurs outside of the nucleus. 
So we're going to talk about three processes of protein synthesis, and RNA is the molecule that helps us do that. And these processes are transcription, translation, and transfer. Okay, first we're going to talk about transcription. Now remember, this is the process of transcription is duplicating a section of DNA. Now, also important to remember that transcription takes place in the nucleus. And so transcription is going on right here where I've made this red circle inside the nucleus. So what is happening? What happens is there is some determining factor that a new product is required. So the DNA, the segment of DNA that contains the code that needs to be copied is going to split apart like you see right here. I can draw an arrow. All right. So you see that right there. The DNA is splitting apart. Now this allows transcription to take place. The DNA unwinds and messenger RNA or mRNA is formed. All right. Now remember, anytime there's coding with RNA, you're going to get base pairings that do not have thiamine. Okay, so now in this context, guanine is still matching with cytosine. Every time the mRNA encounters a guanine, it's going to create a complementary base pair cytosine. The reverse is true. If it encounters a cytosine, it's going to create the complementary pair guanine. However, if it encounters adenine, it is going to create a complementary base pair uracil. Now, what if it encounters thiamine? If it encounters thiamine in the DNA, it is still going to create a complementary base pairing of adenine. After transcription has taken place in the nucleus, the mRNA, the messenger RNA, leaves the nucleus through a little hole called the nuclear pore and goes out into the cytoplasm. At this point, translation can occur. Now, before we get too far into translation, let's just define what a codon is. A codon is a series of three nucleotide bases that act as a code for a specific amino acid. There are also two other types of codons, which are start codons and stop codons. This tells the rRNA, or the ribosome RNA, where to attach on the chain of messenger RNA. So those two subunits of the ribosomes are going to lock on to the mRNA, and they are going to read each set of three nucleotide bases, or codons. Each of those codons code for a specific amino acid. Now they get some help here by the transfer RNA or the tRNA. The tRNA is going to respond to what the ribosome is reading in the codon and is going to bring that specific amino acid to dock at each codon along the mRNA. So each of the amino acids will be bonded to one another, and this process will continue until the ribosome, the rRNA, comes to the stop codon. At that point, translation stops, the ribosome breaks apart, and the polypeptide chain will enter the rough endoplasmic reticulum and continue through the synthesizing process. Here you can see a detailed overview of the transcription and translation process that occurs in the cell. It's the same one that is in your book on page 58. I would highly encourage you to access the resource section of your course and watch the video on protein synthesis. But you can see here, where transcription takes place in the nucleus, 
the new strand of mRNA is created. mRNA leaves the cell through the nuclear pore and goes out into the cytoplasm where the two subunits of ribosomes lock on to the mRNA at the start codon. Now they continue to read this chain three nucleotides at a time, and each of those sets of three bases or codons code for a specific amino acid. So you can see right here, this is the transfer RNA, and it is bringing this special amino acid to the docking station, and you can see them building this polypeptide chain. Now again, this is going to continue until it reaches the stop codon. The ribosomal unit is going to break apart and synthesis will con of the protein will continue to take place inside the ER. Just as problems can occur when active transport processes are not working correctly, disease can also be linked to protein synthesis. Abnormal DNA that is inherited or that results from damage is often the basis of disease. Many diseases have a cellular basis, so they are basically cell problems even though they might affect the entire body. Some factors that cause damage to DNA molecules include chemical or mechanical irritants, radiation, bacteria, and viruses. So what are some mutagenic substances that we are exposed to in the OR? Any guesses? Some that come to my mind right away is exposure to gamma radiation through x-ray. We also are exposed to plume from bovi smoke, which contains particles of DNA of the patient that we could potentially inhale in. There are other chemicals like cement that we use to fix um, implants to bones. Uh, those types of things are also mutagenic substances that we're exposed to in the OR. Okay, we're coming into the home stretch here and we have one more thing to talk about, which is cell reproduction. Now, when we talk about the cell life cycle, we're talking about the different phases of the cell cycle. So reproduction of the cell involves a division of the nucleus and the cytoplasm. We call this mitosis. Can you name the four stages of mitosis? Those four stages are prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. And we're gonna be talking about those on the upcoming slides. First, I wanna talk about interphase. So what is interphase? Interphase is when the cell is not replicating. It's just involved in its everyday activities. That doesn't mean that it, it, it's not doing anything. It's still synthesizing proteins and chemicals and enzymes and those kinds of things, but it is not in the cycle of reproducing itself. All right, now when we talk about um, those uh, phases of prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, these are outside of that interphase time. So during mitosis, two daughter cells revolt, result from the division. So you have one cell and it's going to completely split itself into two and now you have two exact copies of that cell. What did the brother cell say to the sister cell when she stepped on his toe? He said, ow, mitosis. So mitosis is the process of cell division that enables cells to reproduce their own kind and make a duplicate copy. Now, as we talked about before, there are some phases to mitosis, and those phases are prophase, metaphase, 
anaphase and telophase. So we're gonna talk about those in detail. Just before the first stage of mitosis begins, which is prophase, some activities are going to start to happen in the cell when it's still in the interphase phase. So what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen is DNA is going to make an exact copy of itself. And that's where you see these X's in the image that are joined together. The chromosomes have made an exact copy of themselves and they're joined together in the middle by something called the centromere. Once prophase begins, the centrioles, those little organelles that are located very near the nucleus, are going to begin to move to opposite poles of the cell. And they're going to begin making those spindle fibers or those guide wires that we talked about. Something else that can be seen in prophase is the nuclear envelope or that membrane that surrounds the nucleus is going to start to disappear. And this is gonna free the genetic material inside the nucleus. The second stage in the process of mitosis is metaphase. When metaphase begins, we see that the centromeres have migrated to opposite poles of the cell, and those spindle fibers have attached themselves to the centromeres of the chromosomes. Anaphase is the third stage of mitosis. During anaphase, we see the centromeres break apart at the center of those chromatids and each identical copy of the chromosome will be pulled to the opposite ends of the cell. Well, this is also where we see the beginning of that cleavage furrow or a little indent in that circle where the cells are now starting to define themselves as two identical daughter cells. During the fourth and final stage of mitosis, telophase, cellular division is now complete. There are two exact copies or daughter cells. Nuclei appear in the daughter cells. The nuclear envelope, envelope and nuclei appear and cytokinesis has taken place, which means the cytoplasm has divided and now these cells are completely functional and enter the interphase stage. At this point, I wanna encourage you to watch the video regarding mitosis in the resources area of your course in Blackboard. And I did find this image and I thought it might be helpful to remember the different phases of mitosis. So if you look here, we're, we're not really talking about prometaphase, but I think this is still helpful. If you can remember that interphase is the inter or in between, right? So this is when the, the cell is not actively engaged in division or mitosis. Now the actual phases, the first phase, remember, is prophase. Prophase, pro meaning first. If you're a pro, you're a cut above the rest, so prophase is going to be the first phase. Now let's skip down to number three. Meta, meaning middle, is going to be the middle phase. Then anaphase, a away, right? The chromosomes are pulled apart to opposite poles, and then telophase is going to be that very last uh, T minus two and counting. Okay, so maybe this might be helpful. Another way I remember the order is to just remember in my head PMAT, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. Now we're just gonna quickly define some terms associated with changes in cell growth. And the first one is hypertrophy. Hypertrophy refers to an increase in the cell size. Don't th get this confused with hyperplasia, which means an increase in the number of cells. So hypertrophy, the increase in the size of the individual cell, 
This can be seen in BPH or benign prostatic hypertrophy where the cells of the prostate become enlarged. However, this does not always indicate cancer. Um, it can be a benign situation that's non-cancerous. So the second term is atrophy. Atrophy is the opposite of hypertrophy, meaning decrease in the size of individual cells. You might hear this in reference to muscles. When a person cannot ambulate or get up and get around or move themselves, their muscles begin to waste away and we call this muscular atrophy. Lastly, we're going to talk about a couple terms that refer to changes in cell reproduction. Now, a lot of times this can indicate a type of cancerous or malignant growth. The first one is hyperplasia. Remember, I said that hyperplasia is the increase in cell reproduction. More cells are being produced. This causes an increase in the size of the tissue. An example could be a skin tumor. Uh, produced by overproduction of skin cells. And secondly, anaplasia. Anaplasia is the production of abnormal, undifferentiated cells. Now this is where we can get cancerous tumors or malignant tumors such as lung cancer. Lung cancer causes the production of abnormal cells that do not function properly. There are two types of tumors that this chapter refers to, and they are benign or neoplastic versus malignant. Uh, now we'll talk more about neoplasms in chapter six, but for now, understand that neoplasms may be relatively harmless growths, and these are referred to as benign tumors. Now, if a tumor cell can break away and travel through the vascular system or the lymphatic system to other parts of the body, this becomes what we refer to as a malignant tumor or cancer. This concludes our lecture on chapter three, cells. Make sure that you identify your muddy points for this lecture and be prepared to discuss them in class. Thank you.